one of the most motivating reoccurring dreams I have is I'm back in high school and I did great in high school, but I really despised, you know, being there. And I felt like it was very limiting and I couldn't, you know, study the stuff that I wanted to do. And I feel like I'm back in high school, but something happened and I'm like, I'm still my current age, right? I'm like 30, 38 right now. And I'm 38, but for some reason I'm back in high school and I'm like, holy shit, I had all these ambitions. I had all these dreams for stuff that I wanted to do. And for whatever reason now, I'm like studying, studying trigonometry again, right? And I'm going through my whole day at class in high school and I'm sitting in classes and for some version I've like been held back. This right? is a dream or this, this is, a dream. is a visualization? This is a dream. Okay. This is a dream. Yeah. And then because I'm also like into lucid dreaming, some way through I wake up and I'm like, okay, I'm in my high school. Okay, I have control. Wait, how did I get here? And I have this realization like, no, I'm I'm living my life. I'm a grown human being. I'm an adult male who has started businesses and written stuff and has a podcast. And I feel so fired up that day because I just went through an entire visualization of being back in what my mind would deem to be a worst case scenario, which is being back in school, being held back for some sort of reason and not being able to do all the stuff that I want to. And I feel energized the entire rest of the day when I actually get a chance to wake up. So just another example of me personally feeling like visualizing or whether it's a dream or meditating on your death or meditating on what you would miss out on life if you can't rise to vacation or take care of your health or be there for the you know your family in the way that you want to can be a big motivator for things yeah it's interesting the um uh dreams you know of course for you know centuries people have wondered about the significance of dreams but it's very clear that in the early part of your night your sleep and your dreaming is related mainly toward physical repair of the body and toward learning of motor skills you know that you, there's a predominance of what they call slow wave sleep or non-REM sleep, non-rapid eye movement sleep. In the later half of the night toward morning, you shift over to having more REM, rapid eye movement sleep. And there's a heavier emotional load to those dreams. This is well established. What's interesting is that something is written into our biology, into the genome of everybody, where these emotionally laden dreams in the second half of the night, they're happening, but the body is incapable of releasing adrenaline. You're, we're also paralyzed during REM sleep. We're what's called atonic or, you know, we have atonia. We're completely paralyzed, probably so that we don't act out our dreams. Although no one really knows. As I always say, I wasn't consulted at the design phase and no one else I know was either. So anyone that tells you why something is the way it is should be a little bit suspect. But you have these dreams that are very emotionally intense and yet you don't have adrenaline released into your system. And people who are deprived of that second half of the night dreams tend to have more emotionality during their day. Little things seem heavy. This seems to be a portion of our sleep that is a bit like trauma release therapy. In a lot of trauma release therapies, the idea like EMDR or in just standard psychoanalysis and psychotherapy of various kinds, cognitive behavioral therapy, you know, these are board certified approved um, treatments, at least in the US and, and in other countries as well. It's all about recounting the event, but trying to uncouple the event from the negative emotion and the feeling of agitation. It's about really being able to get close right up, you know, in, in, in front of you, your face with the, with the experience and experiencing that but being comfortable feeling it all without doing anything about it. And so in sleep, we experience these, this emotional fear. We have fear in our second half of the night dreams, but we can't act, at, we can't do anything about it. So talk about, you know, you know, exposure therapy. We get that every night. Now, some people will wake up from those dreams and immediately the adrenaline system will kick on and it'll be, and you're just like, oh my goodness, that was so scary. That actually shows you have a healthy adrenaline system, you know, that when you wake up, it's really immediately available. And a lot of people think, oh my God, that was such a dreadful dream or troubling dream. That was your brain trying to uncouple the emotionality of previous days events and old events. And if you, again, if you deprive people of that particular stage of sleep, they go through life feeling emotionally weighed down by their previous experiences. If you've ever been sleep deprived, the littlest things can seem heavy. You get two nights good sleep or three nights good sleep, the whole world looks different. It just looks better, it feels better. And so I, I find it fascinating. I didn't know we were gonna go down this path because we started off by talking about, you know, using fear as a tool to move through things and work through things and be motivated. And in your description of this dream about high school, it, it reminded me that in sleep, we have this process ongoing. And for people that are having the same dream over and over, it's probably the case that the body needs multiple cycles. The brain needs multiple cycles of this because it's so deeply wired into us, whatever it was. And for people with PTSD, a big part of the exposure therapies is to really bring in a safe setting and a clinical setting, obviously, to bring people to the point where the very worst thing they could possibly imagine is it's almost as if it's happening. And then little by little, the amount of adrenaline is turned down and turned down and turned down. People never, people, 
might be upset to hear this, but you never forget your traumatic experiences. Totally. And that's for, yeah. as you've shared before, it's for a specific reason, right? Our brain wants to hold sure. on to them, to file them, right. to, to you know protect us. Right. But you can reframe the emotional component. You can unweight the emotional load. And this is why I think that sleep is so foundational. The great work of Matt Walker and um, and the Stanford folks at the Stanford Sleep Clinic, you know, and, and many others, of course, there are many great sleep scientists out there have really unpacked this in incredible period of our life we call sleep. What has not happened yet and what is and something that's very important to me and my lab's mission and, and many other labs also is we need a taxonomy, a naming system for waking states. You know, for sleep, we have REM and slow wave sleep. We know what the early night is for. We know what the second half of the night is for. We go through our waking life talking about things like happiness, sadness, depression, stress, anxiety, and fear, but it's, it's all pretty vague. And I think one of the exciting things that's gonna happen in the next 10 years or so, hopefully sooner, is that we're really gonna start to understand what is creative work? What is focus? What is conversation? What is pair, what is bonding? You know, and really understand those things at a biological and psychological level to the point where we can also, um, I don't really like the word hack, but that we will be able to uh, pull apart the different components and really understand, you know, maybe we should, I'm making this up, so please don't take this as a recommendation, but maybe we should all be focused on uh, activities that increase our, uh, you know, acetylcholine early in the day, and then we should gradually be turning that off. You know, we all hear don't drink caffeine past 4 p.m., you know, and messes with your sleep. Well, maybe there are things that we should be doing, you know, for our waking states. And so one of the things that excites me now is that um, because of the unfortunate events of 2020, most people now are tuned into the fact that they have a brain and a body. They're very much connected, that we're all subject to stress, that we're all grappling with things and challenged. And I feel like the the universe, the universality, the universe, is that a word? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Maybe, gosh, I didn't get it. Someone always writes to me as like, you know, corrects my, my speech at some point. Right. Um, the universality of, of, of our of our nervous system has really been, been presented to us that um, things like resilience and motivation and trauma and fear, everybody struggles with these things. Everybody and anyone who seems like they don't or anyone that pretends like they don't is um, has got a different neurologic issue that we can talk about in a different episode.